everyone and welcome to our webinar for this afternoon. We're not going to really get started in earnest just yet. We're going to take a couple of minutes just here at the beginning to allow folks to arrive. I know lots of people who are going to be here today are going to be on their lunch breaks. So while we're uh, sitting here waiting for people to show up, uh, I've asked our presenters to just give them a brief introduction to everyone that's here today. So maybe we'll start with Stu. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Stuart Munch, and I live in Seattle, and I work for uh, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, which is a branch of NOAA, or a part of NOAA. And uh, yeah, a lot of my work has uh, been centered on nearshore ecology in Puget Sound, um, so I'm excited to share some stuff that I've learned with everyone here. Thanks, Stu. Maybe Jennifer, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Jennifer Southerst. I'm the senior staff biologist with the Comox Valley Project Watershed Society based in Courtney, BC. I've been with the society since 2014. I have an extensive background in both terrestrial, freshwater uh, restoration, as well as marine restoration. Um, in the last little while, I've been focused on uh, salt marsh restoration in particular for salmonids. So that's my background and uh, yeah, really happy to be here today. Thanks. And Nikki, do you want to go ahead? Sure. My name is Nikki Wright, and I'm the executive director of a small nonprofit environmental organization called Sea Change Marine Conservation Society. We're based in Brentwood Bay, which is the unceded territory of the West Sanic people. Um, and I just feel very uh, appreciative of being invited to talk about near shore ecology, conservation, and restoration in the Salish Sea. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nikki. Yeah. So that's our panel for today, and we'll just kind of hang out for another minute or so. We have about 20 people tuned in so far. I'd like to encourage everyone here to make use of the chat. Uh, I know that you're tuning in from either Facebook or YouTube, so I'll be able to see all those comments. Uh, so feel free to let us know where you're calling in from today. It'll be a good way for folks to get involved and engaged in this webinar. So give it another couple of seconds here before we get started. Nice, we're up to 24 folks here now. All right. So I think that's good. We can uh, get started. I'll give a, a little overview of what we'll be, we're all doing here today. So welcome to the second in a series of five Lunch and Learn webinars that will be taking place throughout November and into December. My name is Shauna Dahl, and I work for Rain Coast Conservation Foundation as the Gulf Islands Forest Project Coordinator. I'll be facilitating today's discussion. And if you joined us last week, uh, you know that these sessions have been organized by Rain Coast to address some complex environmental issues that are impacting folks not only on the Gulf Islands and the Howe Sound Islands, but also across the Pacific Northwest and indeed along all of Canada's coasts. Uh, the discussions we're having throughout the series will be explored through a scientific lens with the aim of informing our communities about some of the challenges local governments are facing in addressing the twin biodiversity and climate crises and inspiring those com communities to contribute to to where they can to some solutions. So today we're gonna to be talking about marine and shoreline protections. Uh, the impetus for this session uh, was the order issued by the Ministry of Forest Lands, National Resource Operations and Rural Development back in August, which prohibited any new application for private docks in the Southern Gulf Islands and then the Southeast shore of, of Vancouver Island for the next two years. But the issue of marine and shoreline protection isn't as simple as banning private docks. So today we're gonna to be talking about the different ways that human pressures impact uh, sensitive marine and forest shore ecosystems and some of the efforts being made to reduce those effects. Um, so before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the traditional and unceded territories of the Lagunquan speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. But I often work on the traditional territories of the Wasanich nations, the saltwater people who call the Southern Gulf Islands home. But of course, we many of us know that there's dozens of additional distinct Coast Salish nations on whose territories most of us in attendance today are uninvited, uninvited but grateful guests. So I encourage everybody here today to acknowledge whose land they're calling in from in the chat box. And that chat box is gonna be your friend throughout this stream. Um, that's the way that I'll be able to collect questions for our talented team of panelists. 
So be sure to put all of your questions in that chat box. And after each presenter has given their talk, we'll have a chance for a quick question or two before moving on to the next presenter. If I don't address your questions right away, uh, don't worry. We will be able to revisit those uh, when we're all back together for the panel discussion at the end. So with all of that housekeeping uh, out of the way, let's uh, get started in earnest. So Dr. Stuart Munch is going to be our first presenter. He is an ecosystem scientist that works for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, Northwest Fisheries Science Center. His job is to use data to tell ecological stories that allow people to make informed decisions. He works on nearshore ecology and fisheries issues along the U.S. coast. Stu earned his Bachelor of Science from Gonzaga. Gonzaga University and PhD from the University of Washington. So I'm going to let Stu take it away. So if you want to share your screen, Stu. Sounds good. Let's see here. Is that looking good on your end? Yes, there it is. I'm going to hop off the screen and leave it to you. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to share some work that I've been involved with um, as a grad student. Um, so I wrapped up grad school in 2016. And um, as part of that work, I basically had to get familiar with nearshore ecology and the way that we build along shore can affect um, nearshore ecology, especially with the way um, that salmon use habitats. Um, so that was sort of the, the aim of my PhD dissertation. And then in the process of that, um, I sort of had to learn, I guess, a more, I guess, a greater perspective on, um, like I said, the way that we build long shorelines can affect uh, near shore ecology. So, okay. I want to first, again, acknowledge that this is work that I did as a PhD student. And I had a lot of helpful advisors on this project. Um, two of them in particular were Jeff Cordell and Jason Toft. Um, so I'm the person that's sharing these ideas today, but we all came up with them together. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, so to make sure that we are all on the same page here, I'm going to be talking about Puget Sound, which I think everyone that's listening is probably familiar with. Um, but just wanted to call attention to the way that things are under natural conditions here along waterfronts. So we have these beaches that have a lot of sand. They have, for instance, they have an inner tidal zone. They have backshore vegetation. Um, there's a lot of rack that washes up on shore. Um, and so this is the natural state of a lot of the waterfronts around Puget Sound. And so these are real great places uh, for fish like juvenile salmon because it's a place where there's a lot of small prey. So a lot of little invertebrates will grow in the uh, in the inner tidal zone or basically on the, the sea floor that's right next to the waterfront. And then there's also a bunch of insects that grow in the uh, vegetation in the back shore. And so all of those kind of fall into the shallow water there. And then fish like salmon really are clustered up um, really close to the shoreline there. Um, so it's a good place to grow quickly. Um, and another thing is that there's not very many predators there. So when you're right next to shore, there's just not enough room for big predators or probably enough room for big predators uh, to feed effectively. And so this picture is a cartoon, but it's actually pretty accurate here in that um, if you were to go out in the middle of springtime along Puget Sound, there would be salmon right next to um, shore chowing down. And so these areas are sort of an, an out migration corridor. Um, so Today's talk is really about two different types of um, shoreline modifications. And that's going to be armoring and overwater structures. Um, so armoring is essentially hard, heavy material that you put into the uh, inner tidal zone to prevent erosion. So that's typically something like concrete or a bunch of big boulders that you stack at the bottom of the concrete. And then, uh, and then about a third of Puget Sound's shorelines are armored, so there's a lot of it. And then I think everyone knows what an overwater structure is, but that's essentially something like a pier or a dock that uh, shades the water below. So our story sort of kicks off, I guess, around 2007. Um, well, that's when the paper came out, so probably more around 2005, um, when people started to notice that 
there's a lot of these shorelines in Puget Sound that are really highly, highly modified. In some cases, they're pretty urban. Um, and yet there's still a lot of fish that are clustered up next to the shoreline that are trying to make use of those habitats, um, especially juvenile salmon. And so that brought up the question of how shoreline armoring and overwater structures are affecting the function of these habitats. Um, and so just again, to make sure we're on the same page here, I'm gonna be talking a lot about salmon and I'm gonna be talking about the uh, juvenile stage where they just swam out of the watershed and they're headed out to the ocean um, because that's the, the part of their life cycle where they're um, gonna use these waters that are right next to shore uh, that people tend to modify. And so the, the way that my work came up in grad school was that uh, there's a, a seawall along downtown Seattle, and they originally built that in 1934. And then in 2001, there was an earthquake that damaged the seawall and made it so that people had to replace uh, that seawall. And so people figured if they're going to rebuild the waterfront, um, maybe we can do a better job at uh, providing better fish habitat. And so we had to ask some basic questions like, do armoring and overwater structures impair fish habitat? And can we improve habitat even though we can't restore it? You know, can we still um, repair some of these um, lost habitat functions? And so Elliott Bay, which is the downtown Seattle waterfront, that's that body of water um, that borders the downtown Seattle waterfront, is sort of this experimental system where people are trying to figure out if it's possible to um, repair some habitat functions even within a, a highly urbanized area. So this is Elliott Bay. It's the, the waterfront's on the bottom of the screen there. And it's a fairly large estuary that borders Seattle. Uh, historically, it was made out of beaches and mud flats, but nowadays it's pretty much all armored. Um, and so it's an economic center, like a lot of urban waterfronts. We can't truly restore it, and we probably wouldn't want to anyway, I guess, given current technology at least. It's a, it's a center for commerce, tourism, recreation, and transportation. Um, and yet again, it's, it's a place where a lot of fish and crabs are, are present. And so that includes Chinook chum and pink salmon. Um, and Chinook salmon are listed as threatened under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. And these are species of cultural, ecological, and economic interest. And so kind of what I was saying before, this is an experimental system because within this fairly small um, strip of waterfront, you have areas that are totally not natural, so they're completely armored. It's just a pure, there's no intertidal zone. It's just a wall of concrete with boulders stacked at the bottom. I mean, I should mention this is as of, let's say, 2012. They have rebuilt the waterfront since, and I'll get back to that later. Um, and then if you go down the street, you can go to a beach that people built that sort of mimics what you might expect under natural conditions. And then if you go underneath a pier, you have this completely novel ecosystem. There's no natural analog um, for an area that's under a giant pier. So what we can do is we can compare habitat use among sites with these different modifications. I'm just asking if salmon and other fish are using their habitats differently depending on how the shoreline is modified. And so I'm going to basically speed through a lot of findings um, from studies that I just want to point out. These are all empirical observations. These are um, observations that people made by netting fish or observing them underwater with snorkel or scuba. Um, or sampling plankton directly from the water, or um, retrieving diets from salmon, um, or in the case of surf smelt, people monitored eggs. And so again, these are quantitative empirical observations um, that took place for about a decade, um, and there's quite a bit of, of observation. So again, this is what we know is happening, not necessarily what we, um, it's, it's what we know is, is happening. Okay, so the most obvious thing is that if you compare a waterfront that looks like a beach to a waterfront that looks essentially like it has a wall of concrete with boulders stacked at the bottom, is that you get different fish there, uh, different crabs as well. So there's fish and crabs that like to burrow in the sand, and they're not going to be there if there isn't a sandy shoreline. And there's also fish that like deep, rocky habitat, and they're going to be present at those um, highly modified uh, seawall and riprap boulder uh, type waterfronts. The next thing we noticed is that 
under, uh, I guess not natural conditions, but the conditions where there's at least an intertidal zone where there's shallow, sort of a sloping shallow habitat. Uh, what you're going to notice is that the very tiniest salmon are using the very shallowest waters. So this is typically chum salmon, say like in February when they're really small, they are right next to the shoreline. And as they get bigger, they sort of drift off um, into deeper waters. And we think it's because those shallowest areas are probably the very safest um, and they might also have good prey. Um, but as the fish get larger, they don't need to um, stay in as safe of areas. They don't have to limit themselves um, to a, sh a shallow area, which maybe limits feeding a little bit. Um, but the point is there seems to be this trade-off where the littlest fish will use the shallowest, they'll restrict themselves to the shallowest habitats, and then they'll move offshore into deeper waters. Um, but we saw that that only happens in areas that actually have an intertidal zone. So if you go to a seawall waterfront where the water is immediately deep next to shore, there's um, a lot less smaller fish there. To show just a little bit hard data here, this is essentially a histogram showing um, the frequency uh, this of, is it showing a size distribution of fish compared um, between low gradient shallow shorelines and armored shorelines? Um, and essentially what this is showing is that fish are a lot bigger along those armored shorelines. So you're essentially missing the smaller, smaller fish. Uh, the next thing we found is that shoreline armoring exposes salmon to predators. Uh, so again, in those, those deeper shorelines, you've got these fish, the fish like lingcod that prefer deep rocky habitat and you'll find them right uh, along the border of land and sea, which is where salmon are clustered up um, next to. So under, a nat under natural conditions, you wouldn't see little salmon overlapping with these predators as much. Um, the next thing we noticed is that salmon have to switch what prey they're feeding on along armored shorelines. So under natural conditions, there's a bunch of little, uh, they call them copepods. They're these little invertebrates that salmon feed on when they're little. Um, and especially chum salmon feed really heavily on the ones that are, um, the, well, they're, they feed really heavily on the copepods that are produced in the sand. So if there's no sand there, um, there's none of those um, epibenthic copepods. And so they have to switch to feeding on a different type of prey, which we don't think is as nutritious, or maybe it's harder to catch. Um, but the bottom line is that armoring shorelines impacts what salmon are feeding on. And again, just to kind of show you a little bit of hard data here, these are diets from small chum salmon. Each one of these dots is a single diet. And on the left panel, it's comparing the number of planktonic copepods in the diet to the number of epibenthic copepods in the diet. And it's color coded by whether we caught these salmon at a beach or a seawall site. And so what this is showing is that it's sort of all or nothing. If you're at a beach, these salmon are gonna feed entirely off of epibenthic copepods, which are the ones produced in the sand. Whereas if they're at a seawall site where there isn't uh, an intertidal area, they have to switch over to feeding on uh, plankton. And so the panel on the right shows that there's a little bit of nuance in this finding. It's that, you know, you're not starving these fish by um, modifying the shoreline. They're still going to eat the same amount of food, but we think that the food is less nutritious. Um, and then there was another study. This isn't one that I was involved with, but I just knew of it. Um, and the idea is that um, these areas that have natural intertidal zones also have a lot of vegetation that keeps the intertidal zone um, a little bit colder, a little bit wetter. And then um, so surf smelt and other fish that uh, spawn in the intertidal zone uh, tend to have eggs that survive better along these uh, more natural shorelines. Okay, I'm going to move over to a uh, move on to effects of piers. I'm going to show you what it's like to go underwater next to a pier in downtown Seattle. So there's a lot of fish. There's a lot of critters. There's crab. You know, there's algae everywhere. And then as soon as you swim underneath a pier, uh, you just see this dramatic loss of biodiversity. And so that's kind of the issue with large piers. Um, we showed quantitatively that, it's, that basically what's happening is that there's no fish underneath the piers. Um, we do see crabs under there for whatever reason, um, but these salmon, the salmon especially, seem to swim right up to the the uh, shade line that's cast by the pier. Uh, 
and circle around, circle around for a while instead of swimming under. And then every once in a while, when we did see salmon underneath piers, they wouldn't feed there. So it seems like areas, these areas that are underneath heavily shaded areas are providing really poor habitat for salmon. And so this is an issue in a place like downtown Seattle because there's just so many piers. There's salmon trying to migrate along the waterfront here, and then you have just this gauntlet of piers. So you can imagine if they get stuck at each one of these, instead of swimming underneath them, they just sort of um, mill around for some indefinite period of time. That could be an issue as far as migration goes. So to summarize everything, armoring can alter species composition. It prevents ontogenetic habitat shift. Uh, in other words, it prevents those little fish from using the habitats that they want and then moving off to deeper habitats when they want to. Um, it exposes small fish to predators. It can reduce consumption of preferred prey and then it can lower egg survival. Um, and then overwater structures can reduce fish abundance and it might interfere with the movements, the large scale movements of migratory fish and it prevents fish from feeding. And so I mentioned that they rebuilt the Seattle waterfront and the idea was um, whether we could repair some of these lost habitat functions. Um, we did find that built beaches provide better habitat than armored shorelines. So these pictures are of the same location. This is Olympic Sculpture Park in downtown Seattle. And we did find, my, my lab group, I should say, found that um, these, uh, these built areas are providing um, much better habitat than just a, uh, just basically a straight wall of concrete. Um, and then also, if you look at this picture, you can see that people like hanging out here too. So it's kind of a win-win for fish and people. So again, just to show this in kind of a conceptual diagram here, if we start from the left, there's some vegetation that produces insects and ideally those insects fall in the water for fish to eat. The inner tidal zone produces more prey that fish like to eat. Um, you can get flat fish that are at these, um, inner, these sandy intertidal habitats. And then we also saw a lot of larval fish at that uh, site that I just showed which is the only shallow water habitat um, for about a mile as you're coming out of the uh, Duwamish River. So it seems kind of like an oasis. Um, something else that we figured out was that, you know, if you can't actually build a beach because you're in a highly urbanized waterfront, you can still build an artificial intertidal zone. So this will create more prey for fish and it still lets those small salmon use the shallowest habitats, um, which we think are safer. And then if you can't, um, even do that, if there isn't enough room, you can still add texturing to the seawall, which will produce uh, more prey for fish like salmon. And then we also did a real quick pilot study where people essentially, so this is uh, the pier next to the aquarium where people um, put in a bunch of surfaces that were designed to let light through underneath the large pier. Um, they put them all right next to each other so we couldn't tell which type best, but essentially they all got light down to the water beneath the pier. And so essentially what we found was that it looked like salmon were able to use those areas under uh, light to those areas. Um, and ever and since I graduated in 2016, there's been a couple more graduate students that have worked on this project um, that are actually published papers, I think, right now um, that'll answer the question of whether or not um, these uh, light, we call them light penetrating surfaces. Um, if a corridor that we install along the downtown waterfront actually provides um, better migration opportunities right along the downtown waterfront. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like on the left, these are little glass blocks that are built into the, the concrete that's over the water. And they've put those in throughout the entirety of the downtown Seattle waterfront. So that's what uh, those grad students have evaluated. Um, so yeah, a few more pictures of what this looks like. So looking on the bottom left, you're looking up uh, at those at those surfaces. On the top right, there's people walking on them. And then the, the pictures on the bottom are showing you uh, seawalls that are built to, to provide better habitat for um, fish like salmon. And this, this is also nice because it's sort of an educational opportunity, right? If you put kiosks and signage up, um, it's a good way for people to learn about um, fish ecology that's right next to a waterfront that they use a lot, but they might not be uh, thinking about the fish that much. So yeah, you can come up with this idea of, you know, can we do better given what our constraints are? Or if you're in a highly, we're going from left uh, to right, you have increasing human constraints where the idea is, 
if there's room, you can still build beaches that mimic natural habitat. Um, if you have less room to work with, maybe you can build piers and docks that don't take up as much space right along the shoreline to reduce shading, or you can have artificial intertidal zones. And then even if you need a really urbanized waterfront, you can still build seawalls that produce a little bit better prey for fish or put um, light penetrating surfaces into piers to get more light down to the water. And so, yeah, the big picture is that I talked about fish in Elliott Bay, but this is a, a story that seems to be um, generalizable to a lot of places around the world. So near shore waters are critical fish habitat and fish nurseries around the world. People are modifying them a lot. and the efforts that people did in Elliott Bay are sort of the first of their kind. So it's kind of a pilot project that other places around the world can um, try to build on. And then again, I hope I mentioned that a lot of these habitat features, they're definitely not taking away from any use by people of the waterfront. And in a lot of cases, they're improving it. If you think about like public parks, for instance, providing good places for people um, to, to hang out or do whatever they want to do while well, they also provide um, good habitat for fish. Um, so with that, I just wanna acknowledge my funding and my advisor. And then um, if anyone needs like an overarching reference that goes over the, all the concepts that I addressed in this talk, um, there's just this one uh, paper that addresses all of them. So I guess with that, thanks for listening and I'll take any questions. Hi Stu, thanks so much for that informative talk. Uh, not a lot of questions have come through the chat just yet, but I do encourage folks to start sending those through. But I do have a couple of questions, so I'd like to ask you one of those uh, to get us started with questions. Um, obviously, Seattle is a really big city, heavily urbanized. As an alternative to shoreline hardening, has there been a move towards more green shorelines? Is that a feasible kind of like a living shoreline type model, is that feasible within a really heavily urbanized area like Seattle? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there's been a movement for sure, just in, in general, to kind of think twice before you put in shoreline armoring, because there's a lot of waterfronts, for instance, that aren't at that much risk of, um, of eroding, so you don't have to have it. And then again, you know, if you have a backyard with a big beach in it, that can be more fun than um, a backyard with a, a wall of concrete. Um, but yeah, no, I think it just depends how much room you have to work with. Mm -hmm. These are, I mean, this area, like downtown Seattle is so modified that, you know, like the shoreline's in a different place. People have literally dug up and like regraded the hill that used to be there and pushed that into the water. Um, so I think it just kind of depends on where the infrastructure is. And if you have room, then yes, you can definitely put in better options. But, you know, people have been building there for a long time. So a lot of times you don't have room to work with. Totally. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we're going to pop over to Jennifer, but we'll have more time for questions with Stu at the end of the session. Uh, so please, folks, continue to send in questions. So I'm just going to bring Jennifer to the stream and take Stu away. Jennifer, I will share your screen. There you go. And I'm going to okay. hop off. Let me know okay, if you great. need anything. Okay, thanks. No, that should be good. Thanks so much. Um, so yeah, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Project Watershed, the organization that I work with, we're a nonprofit environmental stewardship organization, and we have over 25 years of experience working with uh, volunteers mainly, um, as well as some paid staff uh, to basically steward sensitive habitat in the Comox Valley area. Uh, very much from our inception, we were focused on watershed restoration, uh, but over time, we started working on the restoration of our local estuary, the Comox Estuary, and now we've really scaled up our efforts and are doing more coastal restoration work. Um, before I get too far into my presentation, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that the area where we conduct our work covers the traditional unceded territories of the Comox, Qualicum, Wewakai, and Wewakum First Nations. So we were really fortunate in 2017 that we uh, got a large grant for five years uh, from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And that contribution really allowed us to plan future work and scale up our work in our area. So the objective of that project is to restore eelgrass, salt marsh and kelp habitats. These three marine vegetative types form a migratory corridor for salmon, uh, what we like to refer to as the salmon highway. 
So uh, the restoration and preservation of these marine areas uh, and habitats can also provide you know, benefits for resiliency for climate change, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, and also to help build coastal recovery in general as well. So the area we're working in, which Stuart talked about, is the nearshore area. So this uh, graphic just shows that, that nearshore area that we're working in. So nearshore habitat is the area between the shoreline bluffs uh, to where the water deepens and it becomes too deep for light to actually penetrate and to support plant growth. So this area includes marine and estuarine habitat, but it stops at the point where salt water no longer mixes with fresh water. And it can include rocky and sandy beaches, mud flats, kelp and eelgrass beds and lagoons and it also includes the backshore area which Stuart also talked about where we often see the direct impacts of coastal shoreline development. So one of our goals through this project is to increase uh, habitat connectivity of intertidal and subtidal areas so that you get this sort of continuous uh, zone of habitat versus patchy fragmented habitat um, so that salmon basically have access to quality habitat at a variety of uh, tidal cycles. So I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit about some of the benefits and the ecosystem services that the coastal shoreline provides. If you have a healthy coastal shoreline, um, you know, it provides obviously habitat for fish and wildlife, but they also help to dissipate or sort of buffer the wave energy naturally, which is really important in this era of climate change when we see higher sea, level ri sea levels rising and higher storm surges. But also the vegetation that's associated uh, with these coastal areas, it can actually purify and filter some of the pollutants that run off of the land before they enter into the marine area. Um, and they also can provide an avenue for carbon sequestration. So through photosynthesis, they store carbon for the long term. So really these areas provide uh, some critical coastal protection and other benefits, uh, but they continue to be degraded uh, by coastal development. So given their importance, it's important to look at restoring where we can these areas and where they are intact and doing well and thriving, uh, maybe conserving those healthy sites. So in terms of threats uh, to the shoreline ecosystems and habitat loss, they come from a variety of uh, areas. Uh, shoreline modifications and, uh, you know, Stuart gave a great overview of that. Um, so in the urban settings, we often see boat ramps, marinas, piers, ports, that kind of thing. Log booms as well in our coastal areas can provide that overhead shading that Stuart was talking about. And they also, the bark sort of falls off the logs and it creates the fiber mat down below, which creates a really unhealthy anoxic layer. It makes it very hard for any benthic life to establish. So seawalls and riprap, uh, they starve beaches of suitable substrate and they can increase erosion. So what they tend to do is they can actually increase the wave energy around and that causes not that area that's hardened to be lost or eroded, but areas on either side of the hardened area can be lost. So this is a picture of Stanley Park in 1926 and you see we've got a lot of sandy shoreline and then this is a picture of the same area in 2007 after the seawalls had been installed for a while. And you can see we've kind of just got a pocket beach there now. So climate change is another threat to these coastal habitats. So we're seeing changing ocean temperatures and it's affecting some of this marine vegetation, in particular kelp, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, sea level rise, another concern, of course, with climate change. So what we're having is now we have this sort of coastal squeeze effect where we have, you know, coastal development right close to shorelines in some areas. And now we've got higher sea levels and we've got higher storm surges. And there's nowhere in there for the natural shoreline to migrate back. There's no room for that shoreline to migrate back as we get rising sea levels and pollution runoff and contamination, another major issue uh, in these urbanized areas. Um, and then physical habitat degradation on the beaches from people driving on the beaches, uh, from harvesting of marine rack or seaweed on the beaches, that kind of thing. And the loss of the marine riparian habitat. So everybody that lives along the shoreline likes a view. So they like to take down the uh, the bushes and the trees that grow along the shoreline. And as Stu mentioned, you know, the, those vegetative habitats provide that insect drop that's so important uh, for fish to feed on, but also they cool the beaches as well. So forage fish, embryos from surf smelt or sand lance, uh, those embryos that, you know, are, are basically developing in the, the shoreline gravels on, of our beaches, they need to stay cool and so that vegetation helps uh, keep them at a, at a stable uh, temperature. 
So our study area where we're doing our coastal restoration project is about uh, 150 kilometers of shoreline and we broke it up into seven zones. So based on the wave action, the prevailing currents, the longshore sediment transport and the drift pattern, uh, all of these different zones had different physical attributes. So we had six near shore zones and actually one offshore zone, which is our kelp zone in our study area. And it encompasses 44 watersheds. So the first thing we did in year one of our project was a really intensive mapping exercise. So we actually went and mapped all this marine vegetation in the area, specifically salt marsh, eelgrass, and kelp habitats to get an understanding of where we historically had these habitat types and where they had been lost, or in some cases where they had been gained. Uh, so some areas were healthy and thriving and we'd actually seen habitat gains. So this provided us with important information on where we could focus our restoration efforts and target potential restoration sites. So this is an example of the mapping work that we did in the Trent River estuary, which is just south of uh, the city of Courtney. And this is the salt marsh mapping. So you can see the areas in black are where we have had no change, the green areas where we gained some habitat and the red areas are where we've lost. And this is the same area. This is the eelgrass change that was seen in that area from 96 to 2006. So over that 10 year period, you can see there was an incredible amount of eelgrass habitat that was lost at the site. Uh, and this is an example of our kelp mapping work. So this will show some of the changes in kelp distribution uh, just off the Comox estuary. So the green area is the kelp that we had present in 1969. And then uh, between 95 and 2005, we saw a marked decline in the amount of kelp in that area. And that's the, uh, the yellow areas. You can see that's where we've lost some of that bull kelp. And then uh, 2018, by 2018, we'd lost all the habitat in the area. And in general, the kelp story is not a good one on the coast. Climate change is warming the ocean waters and it's causing early die off of the kelp before they can actually reproduce. So that's a big concern for us. And what we've been doing is we've been working on growing bull kelp on lines from seed stock that's found growing in warmer areas naturally to see if we can get it to grow in our area and if it will do better than our local stocks. Another part of the project that we did is we did an assessment of the marine riparian vegetation in, in our entire study area. So how much uh, cover we had and we classified it into three groups. Low areas were areas where you had a lot of coastal development along uh, the shoreline and the area had been heavily impacted and denuded of a lot of that uh, marine riparian vegetation. Then we had some areas that were sort of more larger land parcels, more rural areas where we saw some impact uh, in the marine vegetation, uh, but along the a shoreline but not too much and then we had areas uh, which actually were doing well and had a lot of uh, marine vegetation uh, marine riparian vegetation that is and these uh, areas they had marine vegetation from the edge of the shoreline back up 30 meters so the results from that is that uh, we realized that more than half of our area had been impacted by coastal development. So the shorelines along those areas had been altered in some significant way. And the Comox estuary had the greatest proportion of disturbed marine riparian vegetation, which really isn't surprising because that's where we have the most people living in our area. So uh, we developed a coastal restoration plan, which identified 70 potential restoration projects that we could undertake. So based on that, we've now been going out and targeting some of these areas and we've done eelgrass restoration. Uh, and Nikki Wright will probably speak more to this, but we follow an established procedure and harvest donor stock from healthy beds. And then we transplant it into barren areas. Um, and if we do it intertidally, we can do it with volunteers just waiting out at a low tide and transplant the eelgrass. And then if we do it in subtitle areas, we use divers to assist us with that work. And uh, I love this picture down in the lower right. This is immediately after we had done a transplant in the Miracle Beach area, we had a plain fin midshipman that came in and started using some of that new habitat. And we monitor these sites for several years after to see how they establish. And this is an example of some of the uh, salt marsh restoration work that we've done. Um, this is an area in uh, the community of Royston, just south of Courtney. Uh, this area had been an industrial site for many, many years. There had been extensive uh, log booms in the area for decades. And so the habitat had been really degraded by that industrial activity. Uh, the coastal um, there was a coastal shoreline trail there, the Royston Seaside Trail that was heavily used by the locals. Uh, and the regional district was concerned because it was actually suffering from erosion. Uh, so what we did was we built uh, three 
barrier salt marsh islands. And these have intertidal channels around them that allow fish to come up um, with the high tides and come in and feed around these areas. And uh, this is what another angle of what it looked like right after the build. And you can see that the trail in behind there, and then there's, it's hard to see the division, but there's actually the three islands there. They did have a little bit of armoring on the front side at, of them, but at a slope, at a natural one to 10 slope. So that would naturally dissipate the wave energy. And then they were planted all in behind. And this is what they look like one year after planting. And since then they've filled in even more. Uh, and this is another example of a large uh, coastal restoration project that we're undertaking currently. This is the Kuski Sun project. It was formerly known as the Field Sawmill site. Uh, so there was a sawmill located on this site since the 1950s. And over time, what they did is they actually filled the site in, they accreted land, they built a retaining wall, and they actually pushed into the Courtney River. So they channelized the river in that section. And this is a major migratory corridor for salmonids that go up to the two huge watersheds, the Puntledge watershed and the Solemn watershed. Um, so they, uh, they out-migrate as juveniles and they have to go through this area. And then as they return as spawners, they have to, go, have to go past the site as well. And just because of the human architecture in this area, this you know steel cloud retaining wall, uh, basically that allows uh, seals to feed on the fish very easily as they pass by. There's no natural shoreline protection here for them. Um, and as Stuart pointed out, you know there's no areas for the fish to forage and to feed as well. So what we did in uh, 2017 is we actually purchased the site or came up with an agreement to purchase the site from the landowner Interfor. And they gave us a few years to fundraise, to buy the site from them. Uh, at the end of last year, we purchased the site along with our partners in this initiative, the Comox First Nation, the city of Courtney. And then this past summer, we actually started the restoration of the site, the first phase, which was the removal of all the hard surfacing on the site. Next year, we'll be doing all the earthworks in behind the site. We'll be regrading it, creating salt marsh islands and benches, uh, intertidal channels, and starting to plant the whole area. Year three, we'll be doing some more planting work and habitat complexing work. And then finally, we'll be taking out uh, the steel wall to reconnect the site uh, to the river. And this is an artist concept of sort of what the restored site will look like. So this is the site over here that we're working on. And eventually we want to connect it to Hollyhock Marsh. We're fortunate that we have this large conservation area adjacent to the site. Um, so again, it's about creating that connectivity of habitat between the two areas to allow Salmonids access to a much, much larger area of natural shoreline and natural habitat. And I have a quick little video to play that shows how the site could be transformed. And I don't think we'll get sound with this one, but I'll just give a quick overview of what we're seeing. Uh, this is what the site looked like when we had the original sawmill infrastructure in place. And then in uh, 2006, they removed the sawmill infrastructure. They shut everything down, removed the sawmill infrastructure. Um, they actually remediated the site. So there were some areas of contaminated soil on the site and Interfor remediated those before they put the site up for sale. And in those areas, we started to get vegetation coming in naturally. And then our plan is to create these uh, shoreline intertidal channels. And these are based on old historic air photos that we have of the site. So we're trying to recreate what used to be there. Uh, we'll have to regrade the shoreline to create a natural slope. As I mentioned, this is a lot of fill that's been put in there. And the area is a good two, two and a half meters above what the natural shoreline, where the natural shoreline should be. So that's a lot of material to excavate and move out and regrade. And then we'll heavily revegetate the area. We're going to build a bit of a higher berm up along the road here. Uh, that will just create a little bit of flood attenuation capacity in the site. The road is quite low here. Um, so when we have our historic flood events, occasionally it does flood. But it'll also be a way, way rather to use some of the materials that we've excavated out on site. And then finally, we'll put in some uh, paths for uh, people to view and some lookout points. And yeah, that'll improve the area sort of for recreational opportunities for people as well that are kayaking or boating or want to go do some bird watching because the site is in the Comox Estuary, which is a, acknowledged as an important bird area. Um, so really, this is going to enhance the ecosystem functioning. This area, it's going to become a community eco-asset. And then the final step will be to connect the site back up to the adjacent uh, Hollyhock Marsh. And Hollyhock Marsh is the area of the estuary that supports the most salmonid usage right now, juvenile salmonid usage that is for feeding and foraging. 
So historically, this channel here actually did used to connect right through back to the Courtney River. So eventually we'd like to reinstate that connection. So I just wanted to thank some of our financial funders and supporters. Uh, so we've, as I mentioned, received funding from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the province of BC, the Comox Valley Regional District, Pacific Salmon Foundation, um, and the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program, as well as other funders. So thank you very much, and questions? Thanks so much, Jennifer. And I realized after I gave the screen over to you that I didn't actually read your bio, but I did put it in the chat. And I'm just going to read it now so everyone knows what uh, Jennifer's uh, history is. Uh, she's a biologist and environmental scientist and it's wor has worked as an environmental professional and stewardship leader for most of her career and has extensive experience working in freshwater, marine and terrestrial ecosystems, as you certainly saw in her presentation that we just saw ranging from projects as diverse as research on climate change for Simon Fraser University to traditional ecological knowledge surveys of marine mammals for the Namjis First Nation. She has worked extensively with multidisciplinary teams of volunteers, First Nations, government agencies, and nonprofits to achieve habitat protection and stewardship objectives. So just so you know, that's uh, where Jennifer's expertise comes from. So one of my big questions for you, Jennifer, um, looking at your custom project on Comox territory. I've actually been there. I've had the privilege of seeing what you're doing there. Um, I know that that project involves the removal of 8.3 acres of concrete to return the site back to its natural state or to near its natural state. And it's a multi-million dollar project. And it's essentially fallen to Project Watershed and the First Nation to restore. And obviously this is a, an environmental disaster and it's been left over by industry. And I wonder how, what you would recommend to industry now, like how can we prevent the need for this type of restoration in the future? Yeah, well, what I'm trying to advocate for in Project Watershed as well as an organization is protection of that marine riparian zone. So that area that we're seeing impacted by coastal development or industrial activity. Um, we need to see similar protections like we have in BC for the streamside regulatory area. So the, uh, the setbacks that we have along our freshwater corridors, we need to see that same kind of setback in these sensitive marine habitat areas. Um, yeah, so we need to, there is a BC shore zone classification that's actually the province is undergoing an update on that right now. So what they're doing is they have a consultant that's going out and mapping the current status of all the shorelines. So you know, based on that information, then I think we need to now look at like, how can we protect these areas? And right now we have a patchwork sort of quilt of various regulations that, you know, some are municipal, some are federal, some are provincial that kind of protect this area, but not really. And, you know, there's, there's not a complete, you know, sort of overlap and integration of those regulations. And then quite often, you know, you'll think it's in the bailiwick of the federal government to deal with. And it's like, no, that's the province. The province will point the finger back at the feds or at your local municipality. So nobody really actually takes responsibility for this area uh, in many ways. So, you know, if we had a piece of legislation, basically, uh, you know, and we have already a template for that with what we've got for our freshwater streams. So if we could have similar building set backs, you know, along the marine shoreline and protection for these areas. I think that would go a long way. And it only makes sense in this era of climate change when we're seeing issues with sea level rise and uh, that coastal squeeze, like I talked about, to be building, developing further back from the shoreline and trying to protect some of these natural areas that buffer some of that wave action as well. Absolutely. Great answer. Thanks, Jennifer. So we're just going to pop Jennifer off the screen for a little bit here while we listen into Nikki Wright's presentation. But we'll see Jennifer again in just a little while for the panel discussion. So if you have further questions for her, please put them in the chat. So Nikki, there you are. And if you want to share your screen, we'll get it going for you. But while you're working on putting pulling that up, I'll just read off your bio so I don't forget. Nikki Wright has served as the executive director of Sea Change Marine Conservation Society since 1998. Sea Change is a nonprofit charitable society working with community partners on marine education, conservation, and restoration in the Salish Sea and BC. In the year 2000, 1,800 eelgrass shoots were transplanted in Todd Inlet, also known as Sneakwith and Sanchothan, a small inlet of Saanich Inlet north of BC. Victoria, BC, excuse me. From that success was born the Seagrass Conservation Working Group in 2001 and over 400 restored eelgrass habitats within the Salish Sea. So 
Let's see, we're seeing your screen now, Nikki, if you just want to pull up your PowerPoint presentation from the bottom of your screen there. Whoa. What happened? We now have <laughs> infinite you and me's. <laughs> Boy, there's so many of us. What do I do now? Exit I think what screen. happened there was that you hit the icon for sharing your screen actually on the window. Uh, there you go. So if you go down to the very bottom of your screen, I think if you hit that there again, it's going to, yeah, there you go. That's Thank the you. one. There you got go. it. Yeah. Perfect. So if you go into slideshow view, yeah. you should be good to go from here. Yes. There you go. I'm Thank going to hop you. off and leave you to it. All right. Oh, it's always interesting to get on these <laughs> on these digital sites. Um, <clears throat> I have to recover from seeing 100 images of myself. So I'm just so pleased to be a part of this. And I'm just um, so grateful for those two excellent um, presentations. And much of what I'm going to say is kind of a review so um, I don't think this will take very long, and then that'll be, allow us to talk more about um, answering questions and inquiries. So I first want to just begin with giving my um, gratitude and honor Trish Farrell, who was one of the founding members of Sea Change way back in 98. And she is seen here speaking to high school youth on Thetis Island when we are part of a program for uh, high school students across Canada who would board uh, motor vessels and sailboats during their spring break and come into the Gulf Islands. This happened for about five years. <clears throat> and as each year went on, we were able to talk more about the near shore ecology and conservation issues, but other issues were First Nations fisheries and sustainable forestry and a whole myriad uh, slew of subjects, which the students would be totally involved with for a week. Um, Trish here is explaining how she remembers as a youth in Deep Bay, the herring coming into the near shore and her community collecting them on cedar boughs and storing them in bins. And she had a great story that really uh, enchanted the students about taking the row or the herring eggs off the bow, off the bows um, in the back of uh, grandma. And of course, grandma had eyes on the back of her head. So without turning her head, grandma would inquiry, inquire how good are those eggs? And of course her mouth was full, but Trish said they were excellent. That speech that she gave to the high school students so many years ago um, influenced my thinking about how could we give back to the oceans. I was really sick and tired even back in those days of attending fish conferences where we were talking about sustainable yields, which I think is uh, an impossible task and an impossible concept. Um, and so as an organization, I was trying to figure out how could we give back to the oceans instead of keep taking until there's nothing left. And because of her speech, it, it occurred to me that um, we could look at the near shore vegetation that's affected by development and all kinds of human impacts and see where it could be restored. So that started our journey into eelgrass restoration. So even though my topic is supposedly about kelp, <clears throat> I'm really going to center in about eelgrass. Uh, did such a good job of, of speaking about. So back in, <clears throat> excuse me, back in 2012 to 2014, we had the privilege of mapping eelgrass habitat in all 13 islands within the Islands Trust area. And in so doing, we were able to also identify those places that could be possibly restored. If we could figure out the reasons why they were damaged or completely gone. And so that sort of started us on a journey for a more widespread restoration scope within the Southern Sailor Sea. So this was one of the maps that we created with the Galliano Conservancy. It's the um, eelgrass that um, was found during that 2012, the three year period. <clears throat> 
on Main Island. The red uh, is showing the continuous flatbeds and the yellowish is the more the fringing continuous. And you can see that those areas are in really vulnerable uh, estuaries and quiet bays. And they're vulnerable because those are the sites that will be very affected by rising sea levels. So there's a whole area of critical salmon and other marine wildlife habitat that is at high risk right now. So because of that mapping, we, we continued on our trajectory on a wider scale um, in House Sound, Gulf Islands, Sorelli Tooth Territory of Burrard Inlet and Seashelt Inlet. And approximately 40 sites have been restored and we have an approximate 70% success rate based on shoot density and area extent. And we monitor our sites every six months for five years. So this is just a map to show the sites that we've been working in um, and quite intensively around Pender and Saturna um, Islands and some of Thetis and a little bit of Gabriola Island. So from Gabriola uh, all the way down to Saturna. So what's so bloody important about near shores? Well, I think the last two excellent presentations have really driven it home that it's a wealth of ecological assets, not only for marine wildlife, but for us as well. So if we take care of all of that, it will take care of us. And uh, we've also talked about what a living system it is. So if we're talking about the back shore, we've, we've talked about how that filters contaminants and provides wildlife as well as <laughs> our own homes. And um, uh, food for salmon as well as shading for forage fish. And when we talk about forage fish, we're talking about the sand lance and surf smelt that actually spawn on beaches from down here in the Salish Sea around November until spring. And then as we go, uh, closer, so we have the sand lance and surf smelt habitat here. And as we go in, we have the fucus and the eelgrass and the food for the larvae and on and on and on. And it goes all the way out into the kelp forest. And then the deeper water is called the pelagic zone, where we have less light availability for vegetative habitat. But when we talk about eelgrass or we talk about kelp or we talk about wetlands, it's just so important to think of it as one whole system and um, how they're so interconnected. I love what Jennifer referred to as habitat connectivity. So as we think about freshwater systems coming into the saltwater system, all of that integrity of each piece of the watershed all the way down to the estuary or the bays is primary for not only all the marine wildlife upon which it depends, but for all of us as well. Uh, we talked quite a bit about salmon highways. Um, we Canadians stole that phrase from the Puget Sound folks. <laughs> I love it because um, the reasons being that they're, they function as nurseries um, to provide food for approximately 80% of commercially important fish stocks and they serve as a refugia from predators and waves. It's just a few reasons why these estuaries are so important. And of course, for the herring that are really highly uh, much at risk in the Sailor Sea, if um, they rely so much on vegetation for spawning, then it just makes sense that we pay attention to the conservation and restoration of these habitats. And that's what an egg looks like as it's developing. That's pretty cool. When you see it under a microscope, it's very cool. So that's on a grain of sand, and that's sand lance larvae, which then goes, um, develops into juveniles and uses the near shore extensively for shelter and food. So those sandy beaches have so much import for the bottom of the food web upon which orcas depend upon. <laughs> 
not to mention the salmon in between. So I was going to just talk a little bit about the overwater structures, but more in particular about docks, um, because that's um, we kind of went from the large scale of an area as large as Puget Sound to a smaller but large estuary in uh, the northern part of the Salish Sea. Now we're going to be talking more about the Gulf Islands and how docks could be affecting habitats and eventually our way of life, our livelihood, if we allow them to become um, overdeveloped and overabundant in this beautiful, beautiful area of the Salish Sea. So here's a pretty radical picture. This is not of the Gulf Islands, but it shows you multiple docks along here. And I just wanted to show that that could interfere very much with the concept of a salmon highway. It's sort of like, since we're talking about the Gulf Islands now, if we're trying to get from <clears throat> Schwartz Bay to Victoria and there is a landslide every kilometer, <laughs> that's what it would be like for a salmon to try to migrate or, to, or um, any kind of fish species all the way down to pipefish that would try to be using this area, um, trying to get from A to Z um, as if we were going from Schwartz Bay to Victoria and had an obstacle in our, in our way. It would take a long time and be very uh, inefficient energy wise. So from kelps to eelgrass, we have several processes and, and factors to think about when we're talking about uh, docks. And we're talking about um, controlling factors. So in the shallow near shore, we're talking about light availability. Wave energy has to be um, pretty slowed down. Water quality has to be quite good and substrate has to be a sandy, muddy bottom. Um, when we talk about what does that provide? It provides habitat. If those factors are there and in good condition, then we have flora and fauna in those shallow waters. I'm sorry, my dog is acting out. I hope you can hear me. Then we have the processes that those habitats provide, which is temperature regulation, photosynthesis, uh, wave energy attenuation. If we have a lot of um, eelgrass meadows that are intact and continuous, it does slow the wave action coming to the shore. And um, water quality issues are mitigated because the rhizomes or the underwater stems of the eelgrass meadows, and this also applies to kelp, though it's an annual, slows down wave action and therefore the sediment suspended in the water settles onto the seabed. So water quality is then improved. And then if you have all those conditions, because these habitats are flourishing, then we have both the flora and fauna benefiting because of the refugia it provides and the food, um, as well as spawning sites for, for eggs and larvae. But we have the human benefits and just a few of them is that both these habitats are carbon sinks. We call that blue carbon. Now, the, the good news is that the ocean is one huge area of carbon sequestration and storage. The bad news, which I just read in the paper yesterday, is that the ocean is becoming so saturated with carbon from the atmosphere that there's a possibility that the ocean could become a carbon emitter which just uh, really woke me up, that we're getting to that crisis point where we're saturating the ocean. 75, 77% of the globe is so saturated with carbon from human impacts that it might become a carbon emitter. If that doesn't surprise you, um, I'd, be, I'd be kind of surprised. Um, other things, of course, is recreational values, that when our near shores are in good shape, we have many, many uh, ways of recreating. And economic uh, benefits, of course, from the salmon, the, um, the clams, the shellfish. So this is just a diagram taken from an article um, 
uh, written by the Washington State Transportation Commission that just shows the the cascading effects of if we have all those controlling factors, then we have the ecological fa functions for uh, flora and fauna as well as <clears throat> the human assets. And as um, Jennifer had pointed out, we are facing climate change, as you can tell from the storms we've just experienced. So the declines in pH and O2 of the basin waters, which refers to the, the Salish Sea, partly imported from outside the Salish Sea and partly supported by the carbon cycling within the Strait of Georgia, could reduce the benthic and pelagic and habitat, pelagic meeting the deeper waters beyond kelp and sea level rise and storms. And you do recognize that photograph that Jennifer had, such as low-lying estuaries, intertidal zones, and mudflats are at risk. And that was written in 2009. So now we're experiencing what was forecasted. What does this have to do with overwater structures? Well, I just wanted to bring this in first. I don't like to do doomsday slideshows. I don't think it does any of us any credit. So I wanted to show you a nearshore site that we looked at uh, when we were doing a survey of the Saanich Peninsula and Inlet. And this is a pretty healthy system that we're looking at. When I was speaking to a Sartlip steward yesterday, he was reminding us of um, words that his elders have told him over and over again to leave it better than you found it. Because sometimes the, the cultural history and use of an area is corroded or lost because of all the things that have happened to First Nations over these years. But if we just stick to this adage of leave it better than you found it, then when we talk about overwater structures, we can look at what, what would be a healthy shoreline and how can we maintain it that way? And what would be the solutions if the need is to bring a boat to shore or to do recreation? So here's some um, good examples of in House Sound where we work, oftentimes people build um, docks that can be lifted up over the winter months. It makes sense because of the oncoming storms that are getting more severe. And I put this picture down here of the Lady Smith Adventure Center. And I didn't put it there for you to visit, though it's really interesting. But if you ever go to Lady Smith, go down to the, to the water there and look at their dock because it's, a, it's one of those structures that was referred to as light penetrating structure. And, and they did a very, very good job of their very long dock. So um, it's just a really good way of, of seeing something nearby that you could look at if you're considering building a dock. And my recommendation is to get together with your neighbors if there really is a, a crucial need for a dock and to see what dock is existing now in that bay where you live or close to it and see if it could be shared or to build a community dock. These are the kinds of resources. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a very blurry picture, but you've got resources that are really easy to get to. They're very accessible and they're downloadable, even if they're dated a bit. They're found on the Stewardship Center for BC website. And there's three of them, the shoreline structures for environmental design, the access near aquatic uh, areas, and the coastal shore stewardship, which has been updated since then. But the news is all still up to date. Um, and as Stu pointed out, many of the informational points that he spoke about um, are, is included in these books, they're downloadable, as I said, they're free, and they can advise you as to questioning whether you really do need a dock. And if you do, how can you build one that's environmentally friendly, so that light penetrates through it, so that the sediment does not shift from a vegetative one to maybe a shell hash one, because you're putting pilings in the water that encourage um, crustaceans, which then eventually die off and settle on the shells, settle on the substrate. So you're changing the substrate, you're changing the water quality, you're changing the wave action, and you're changing the light regime. And all those conditions cascade down to 
less habitats for flora and fauna, and then less functional uses for both the wildlife and for humans. It may not sound like a lot when you're talking about building one dock in such a large area, but Salish Sea is now totally impacted by cumulative effects, all because there's so many people who love this area. We're loving it to death. I want to thank you all, and especially Cynthia Durantz, who started us on the journey of ecological restoration of eelgrass, the Islands Trust Conservancy, for, um, for all that they offer us as a community and everybody else. And this, I'm going to just keep on for a minute. And these are the resources that you might want to look at in more detail. If you live on a Gulf Island, the eelgrass map that was mapped in 2012 to 2014 of your area could be found on the Islands Trust um, Conservancy website under mapping. Uh, just a, sh a little note that the we were able to just have the resources to survey the presence or absence of eelgrass in the 13 islands within the Islands Trust area. And now it's being mapped uh, in greater detail, which will be very, very helpful for better planning decisions on the near shore. Stewardship Center for BC has excellent information, downloadable and free. And then the Seagrass Conservation Working Group and Sea Change is always there for you as well. And I really thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nikki. So before we welcome the other presenters back for a question period, I did get, I got a question a little bit earlier on, but I think it really pertains to your um, talk, the closest. Um, so I think that you kind of already answered this question, but someone asked how impactful are small private docks? The peers Stu talked about were enormous. What is the impact of a narrow, for example, four to six foot wide dock? Yeah, so do you remember that image of, um, you know, instead of being negative, I'm gonna be positive. That image of that beach where there was a sandy area and you could see vegetation in the water and there was a very intact, back shore, that is a healthy habitat for the forage fish. It's healthy habitat for the uh, spawning herring that may come into that area. If they're not now, maybe in 20 years, if we stop harvesting them so rigorously, they could be coming back. Um, the All that uses the sandy beaches, the rocky beaches, the shallow subtitle, uh, and the back shore, if we keep that as intact as possible, then when we're uh, being impacted by these climate changes that we're experiencing, we have um, an area that can resist these changes and move more, more shoreward. Um, if we have a series of docks in a small area, as I just pointed out, we're changing everything. We're changing the corridor, that salmon highway in both the light regime, uh, in the current, and the pattern of circulation that moves sand back and forth shoreward to seaward, as well as along longitudinally along a bay. So we're changing the circulation patterns, and we're interrupting the migration and the survival of so many species. And we're actually making a regime change in the biodiversity. How would that affect us? Uh, I could go on forever and ever, but it anything that impacts, anything around us impacts us. So I know that's kind of a general, a general kind of explanation, but it's that kind of comparison I made from traveling from Schwartz Bay to Victoria and making all these, um, these interruptions in the highway so that it takes a lot longer and is very uh, inefficient uh, to get from A to B. We're putting a lot of stress on the wildlife. And it seems to me it's one of those questions of the tragedy of the commons, where if everyone makes that builds their small narrow dock, all of those impacts build up together to form yeah. a regime change. Yeah, exactly. And I think we do have to get back to that concept of the commons. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm going to invite Jennifer 
and Stuart back. Stuart has his uh, screen and, oh, there he is. Great, I wasn't sure if you were still there with us. Uh, so folks, if you have questions, you can send them in now, but I do have a few recorded from throughout these presentations. We have about 15 minutes left to address some of these questions. Um, so one question we got pretty early on was directed to Stu. What impact will rising sea level have on highly urbanized waterfronts such as Seattle? Do you think you can speak to that? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'm sure it depends on, you know, it's going to be a case by case basis. Um, I think that in the case of Seattle, when they rebuilt the waterfront, they did think about um, sea level rise. Um, but the idea of coastal squeeze, where you have sea levels rising against infrastructure that's built in the inter intertidal zone, is going to be a major issue. I mean, you're going to have tides that come over the top of impervious surfaces, and that'll cause that'll cause flooding. And so, again, there's an argument of going with a little bit more of a natural defense approach, where if you have if you've built a little bit farther away from the waterfront, and you have something like a beach or some kind of vegetation, as opposed to just concrete that you know isn't going to absorb any moisture at all you know then you're going to be you'll be in better shape i guess with a little bit more natural uh, waterfront mm -hmm. thank you um i'm gonna turn the next question over this one is kind of a more general question that i feel any one of you might be willing to answer a lot of the folks who are tuning in today are tuning in from the Gulf Islands, uh, and most of the folks who live on the islands are dependent on septic systems. And folks are really curious, I've gotten these questions many times before, not just in this webinar, about what the impact of septic systems is on the marine environment. And I wonder if anyone can kind of speak on septic contamination and what those impacts could be on the foreshore and marine environments. Is that within anyone's wheelhouse? Yeah, you know, part of the problem that that we have with restoration, of course, is, as I said, it's all one system. And so, and, and Jennifer can definitely agree with me on this. So if we're just looking at the estuary, whether it's eelgrass or kelp or, or wetlands, and we don't look at the whole watershed and its inputs into those bays and estuaries, then we're only addressing half the problem. <clears throat> and so there are places that we mapped back in 2012 to 14 that um, were really lush. I have one in particular, Lyle Harbor, really, really lush back in the day. And we came back in 2019, just before COVID, and I was astounded by the water quality and the fragmentation of the eelgrass. And so we had to start to address because not much new had happened on the water. We had to address what is going on in the watershed that has made this area so uh, nitrogen rich. Um, water quality was just the poorest I've ever seen almost anywhere. And I'm not saying it was sewage in that point. I'm not going to point to any smoking guns, but I am saying that sewage is one of those impacts that contribute to cumulative impacts. And it's uh, one of the many, many smoking guns that we have to address if we're looking at near shore health, what's coming down the slopes through the back shore and into these waterways that affect the shellfish, that affect the, the flora and fauna. And sewage is definitely, if, if our septic fields are not maintained properly and the regulations have been very relaxed about that, then it's just one of those many, many thousand cuts that eventually destroy or damage the habitat that we're trying to so hard to restore or conserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. And that slide I showed of the Trent River estuary that showed how much eelgrass habitat had been lost. Uh, that upper watershed is uh, the receiving waters for the community of Cumberland sewage supply. And they have a really antiquated uh, sewage sort of settling lagoon, open air sort of treatment system. Um, they've been in non-compliance with the province for uh, decades over this sewage system. And so basically it's fairly raw sewage that's going into that system. And there are some studies out now that show, you know, a correlation between 
uh, decline in water quality and a decline in eelgrass communities. So we certainly have, are seeing that, we think, you know, we haven't been able to make that direct causal link yet, uh, but we think that's probably one of the underlying factors for the decline with the amount of eelgrass at the Trent River estuary there, especially since the community of Cumberland has just uh, ballooned in the last uh, 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. So it's there's been an increasing growth and development in that community, so increasing sewage going out through that river system and into the Trent estuary. And actually, you know, it was one of the sites that we said, okay, we're not going to do eelgrass restoration here until this underlying condition of water quality has been addressed. So luckily now I think uh, the Cumberland is in the midst of upgrading their sewage system, which we're hoping will improve water quality in that area. So in the future, we might be able to consider eelgrass restoration there. Um, but yeah, absolutely, there's an impact on water quality uh, on eelgrass. And we've seen it in Bain Sound with shellfish contamination and closures as well. Uh, Project Watershed in the early 2000s did a huge study on all the, uh, the outfalls in the area and we tested them for fecal coliforms and found cross connections with storm and sanitary lines. And then we went back and, and corrected almost 300 cross contamination connections, which vastly improved the water quality in the area. Wow. What does it mean if a municipality is in non-compliance with the province? What are the repercussions of that? Do they just have to eventually come into compliance? Well, it's it's not much of a stick. Like they were just basically sent a series of letters, uh, the village of Cumberland from the province saying you're in non-compliance. If you don't upgrade your system, you're going to get fined. You're in non-compliance. If you don't get upgraded, you're going to get fined. And then I think last year, the year before, they actually find them they actually issued the fine okay. finally yeah right so there is a fine system there right but it seems like it's a little bit discretionary like how much time they have to get in compliance or take positive action in the direction of coming into line so i don't know exactly how the ins and outs of that right sorry we kind of got off topic from uh shoreline structures and that uh, the, <laughs> the subject of this webinar with that question but i think it was an important one to address um something else that uh, came in is what are the barriers to those uh, modifications on docks that we uh Stu and nikki you both spoke about those modifications with the, the light being able to go through like the glass blocks or whatever it may be to allow uh some light to get through and stop that shading. Um, why aren't all folks putting those into new docks? Is, is it really expensive to do that? Is that becoming more of a norm to uh, building these kinds of structures? Hmm. Ooh, I actually don't know, but I think that if there is a barrier, that seems like a no brainer to get rid of it. Uh, anything right. that we can do to, <laughs> I mean, if there's anything that we can do to kind of grease the gears on that, um, yeah, I, I don't know how much more expensive it is. You know, these aren't, this isn't like new technology. This is as if um, it's the same stuff they use in subways, for instance. You know, if mm -hmm. you're underground, they'll have little glass blocks above you. Um, and then you can do even less than that. You can just have like metal grating, um, mm -hmm. depending on the context. Um, so yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not sure. If there is anything that's in the way of helping people get these installed, it would probably be a good idea to kind of grease the gears. Um, so yeah, it just seems like it. such a simple solution to a problem. Just get more light down there. That seems like something that would be really easy enough to exactly. make a requirement. Yeah, you know, and in the world of conservation, kind of like what everyone was alluding to, there's in more cases than not, it's very complex and it's hard to solve. Um, but with this one, it seems relative to those problems, pretty simple, you know, just try to minimize shading. Um, mm -hmm. So I just I, I don't know what the barriers are, and it could be more economically expensive. Um, but there's the other thing about um, when we put docks in, then we have the boats. When we have boats, we have a need for fuel. Um, and so I would suggest that folks look onto the website for green boating for ways to prevent uh, fuel from getting into the water column. So right. it, it's, it's the associated activities that docks... Uh, bring on. Um, one of the, the most serious problems in the Gulf Islands and, and House Sound especially that we're facing with uh, conservation and restoration of eelgrass meadows is boating activities because so many boats are looking for shelter uh, from wave action and so they go into eelgrass beds not even knowing it and mm. because of the scouring we're seeing more and more fragmentation of the beds. And so it's 
docs, yes, but it's also how can we practice really good boating practices so that we can conserve what we have left and help restore what's been lost. Right. This is a multi-layered issue. I think we're seeing throughout this uh, conversation that it's really uh, difficult to separate these issues of shoreline hardening from overwater structures, from sewage outfall. It's just all, it's all connected. So <laughs> there's a lot of layers here to protecting these marine ecosystems. Um, one question that was posed during Jennifer's talk, but again, I think that all of you have, might have something to add to this. Um, are there any programs or recommendations to encourage a developer to consider restoring an estuary rather than building it out? Right now, it seems like the only option is encouraging or hoping that, that they, they might sell their property before <laughs> developing the shoreline. So is there anything out there that might encourage developers to do better? Mm -hmm. Uh, it depends on your local municipality. Some have um, flood management guidelines and regulations where you have there's setbacks now in terms of where you can actually develop and how close to the shoreline. And in some cases, you have to develop higher as well, so above the current grade. So on some sites, you know, you might be able to have like an underground parkade at the ground level, but you wouldn't be able to have actual living residences or quarters in that area, you'd have to be up above that. So there is some recognition, I think, of sea level rise in that, but it's on a sort of community by community basis. Other than that, there's the uh, Green Shores accreditation for uh, coastal development. And so that's kind of like the lead certification standards that you have for green building. So it's a recognition that, uh, that you've done things in a sensitive, sustainable fashion. And it has a whole bunch of different ways that you can, you know, sort of implement these green shorelines into your development and you know, from you know building further back from the shoreline to not using hard armoring um, to encouraging native plant communities and planting with native plants all that kind of thing um, so yeah so that's but that's more like you know it's not there's not actually any regulation with that it's just it's something that's an accreditation that's nice for a developer to be able to say hey I have green shores certification for this project at a bronze silver or gold level right and actually, speaking of green shores, I believe that UVic offers a continuing education uh, free course on green shores. So if folks are interested in learning more about that, I recommend checking out uh, UVic's uh, continuing education site. Um, so there's, I think, a couple, one more question. We have uh, about three more minutes to address these final questions. Um, this could be one for Stu, maybe. Um, how do contaminants from overpopulation, water stress, and groundwater pollution from sewage and runoff affect salmon health and reproduction? Is that within your wheelhouse, Stu, or anybody here? I don't know if it's totally in my wheelhouse, but I mean, I've definitely read papers where there's some kind of chemical in tires that, you know, gets into everything and kills coho salmon. Um, mm -hmm. I can echo what has been said before, where if you have a, a waterfront that's in pristine condition, there's a project that we're working on now. Um, it looks like the eelgrass is more stable along that waterfront. Whereas if you have something that's more a waterfront that's more exposed to something like pollution, eutrophication, vessel scour, uh, those eelgrass beds are more volatile, um, which might mean unhealthy. Uh, but yeah, the it's not super, super my wheelhouse. So I'll kind of defer to other folks' opinion. Jennifer and Nikki, do you have anything to add? It's, it's just the obvious that you have a pollution soup, nothing is going to thrive in it, much right. less survive. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can't add anything specific. I'd, I'd read about the same study about the tires and there's a significant mm -hmm. pollutant in them that seems to be really impacting coho in particular. Um, yeah, but of course it's those cumulative impacts too of uh, declining water quality. So I think I just have a final question to wrap us up here on a message of hope, I guess. Uh, what is a simple thing that the average person who lives on the coast might be able to do to better steward the shoreline near them? So I've always thought the really simple is every time you're at a beach, pick up 10 things, right? 10 mm -hmm. things that don't belong there, but also, um, using less if no uh, fertilizers and pesticides mm -hmm. on their properties if you're facing a beach affects the crabs and everything else in there in the plant life um 
you know, be careful with uh, consumer practices and make sure your salmon friendly, uh, dolphin friendly products, they do make a difference. Uh, washing machine detergent, all that stuff that goes into sewage systems. Um, ditches, ditches, ditches. I live near the Santa Chinlet. And if all of us as neighborhoods took care of our ditches, because that water just goes directly into the inlet, especially during these storms and a huge amount of non-point source pollution uh, and contamination enters into bodies of water through stormwater. So we could be stewarding these as if they were streams and getting the garbage out of them and making sure that they're healthy um, channels that go directly with no filtering, that go directly into our bodies of water. Those are simple tasks that if we carried them out on a daily basis, um, not only would we be improving the near shores, but we'd be um, strengthening our sense of community because we talk right. to each other when we do these things, right? We start right. to get to know our neighbors. And That's if a great we answer. did that more and more often, I think that um, the pressures that we're putting on the natural world would lessen because we would get that message that we all are connected and we all do care. There's a lot of caring in these communities. We started talking to each other and brainstorming. I really think that we could come up, you wouldn't have to rely on engos yeah. for advice. You'd be creating them yourselves and figuring out the next best step. I really, really believe deeply in community spirit and community compassion for the natural world because I've seen it over and over and over again. I'd love to be out of a job. I mean, I'm getting out of a job <laughs> anyway because I'm getting older, but I'd love to work myself out of a job because restoration would no longer be necessary. Yeah. Um, so I think that's my parting note. Thank you. Nice. Thanks, Nikki. We're actually out of time, but it's Stuart, Jennifer, if you have any quick five second recommendations you might add. I'd just say add uh, plant native uh, shrubs and trees along the shoreline to help restore that marine riparian area. Shrubs in particular, because they don't impact the viewscape if that's an issue, but also their root structure really holds the soils in place. So it helps prevent with erosion as well. Yeah. That's a great recommendation. Stu, anything from you? Yeah, I would say just stay curious and spread the word about this fascinating ecosystem that's right next to us. And a lot of people don't know it. You know, it wasn't until I've lived in Puget Sound area, like for a lot of my childhood. And I didn't know about this ecosystem that was right there until I was in my 20s and pulled in a beach sand because you can't see it. So if you can learn about it and sort of spread the word to your, you know, your friends and family and folks. I think that helps generate a little bit. You know, people care about things when they know about them, I guess. Absolutely. Well, amazing. Thank you so much to our experts for being here. Thank you for our audience for sticking with us to the end. Um, and we'll see you next week for our next uh, webinar in the series on forest protection. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you for being here. Bye, everyone. Thank you.